Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoyed the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everyone. My name is David, covered alcoholic. Hey. I hope everybody memorized the big book. Everyone? No one? All right. Um, if I say anything that sounds like my opinion tonight, please disregard it. Please throw it away. Um, I'm here to carry my experience, strength, and hope, and uh, my experience in the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous, as I've done it with my sponsor and as my, I've done it with my sponsees. So, uh, you know, um, sponsorship is a funny thing. I, uh, several weeks ago, I was driving up to my home group, uh, and uh, I kept thinking to myself, you know, I think, I've, I think I'm going insane you know, and I, am I too old to go insane? 48, you know, I mean, you'd think I'd go insane earlier than this. So I walk into my home group and I walk over to my sponsor and I'm about to pose the question, is it too old to go insane? And he goes, would you like to do a big book study? <laughs> and I thought to myself, yes, I would, you know. And uh, <laughs> for me, that's kind of the, the, the way God lets me know to stop whining and get busy. Um, briefly, um, just a brief qualification is I drank. I don't know, I don't know why you're here tonight, but I drank. And drinking worked. Uh, I have found two solutions in life. One is alcohol, and one is a program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And when I consume alcohol, um, my problems feel as though they're getting smaller. And all of you people start to get nice, you know. And the problem with that is that it's not reality. Uh, when I work the program of Alcoholics Anonymous um, and I strive to maintain a spiritual uh, awakening, um, the reality is that all you people are nice. And my problems really aren't that bad. <coughs> the first time I drank, I was 12 years old. And I don't know about you, but, uh, you know, Twelve was about as long as I could last. Uh, a friend of mine came up to me in the middle of summer, beautiful summer day. He was riding his bike. I was riding my bike. He said to me, uh, you want to get some beer? And I thought, yes, I do. <laughs> I'm 12. <laughs> I, uh, I've been waiting all my life for that question. <laughs> and I thought to myself, I'm going to get drunk. I didn't think I'm going to get a couple of beers and hang out with the guys down by the river. I thought, I'm going to get drunk. I said, what do I got to do? He goes, give me two bucks and meet me down by the river. I gave him two dollars. I had two dollars and 25 cents for the summer. It was 1973. (laughs) And I was willing, you know. Um, And I met him down by the river, and there's a bunch of older kids uh, smoking pot. You know, in a situation like that, normally I would have been baffled as to what to do, but I walked right in, grabbed my six pack of warm Schlitz. You know, uh, opened it up with the, I think it was a, still a church key at that point, for those of you who know what a church key is. Drank two and a half beers and then did something I would never do again. I said, that's enough. And I handed off three beers to somebody else and I went home that night and the world was okay. And I didn't even know the world wasn't okay up until that moment. I had no idea that I was uh, uncomfortable with my own skin, that the world was full of mean people. I knew that I was a little different. I was a lot different, actually. I knew that that you guys were all judging me. But I just thought, ugh, that's the way life was. Two and a half beers later, and and you guys weren't judging me anymore. Two and a half beers later, and you guys were my friends. And I had found a place in life I felt comfortable. The next morning, I bounded out of bed, found my friend Richie, and said, let's do that again. And he looked at me and said something I don't know how you say. He says, no. What? I figured he got caught. I figured he had no money. Now, I only had 25 cents for the rest of the summer, but I was willing to steal the next day. (laughs) It didn't do for him what it had done for me. It solved my problems. I didn't drink again until I was 15. Uh, Then it was a blackout drunk, you know. Um, And I spent the next eight and a half years drinking that way. Um, I tried all the things in the big book. You know, I tried swearing off with and without oath. I tried changing uh, from beer uh, to hard liquor and 
all sorts of things. You know, I tried all those things. And inevitably, there would be periods where I would be able to kind of white-knuckle it for a certain period of time, but never really get any sort of satisfaction for that. Because for some reason, what would happen inside of my gut would be, you would start looking at me weird again. And you're not driving fast enough. And you? (laughs) I just don't like you. And after a while, that becomes a, a burden I don't want to bear by myself, you know? And I need some form of relief. And the only relief I've ever gotten is from alcohol. The periods between when I would be able, when, when things would get so bad that I'd be forced to stop. You know, I was forced to leave New Jersey because there was a guy who was looking for me and my partner to do his physical bodily harm. And we lived under a bush in San Diego. And I'd go downtown twice a week on a, on a bus and give plasma, and get nine bucks, and come back to my bush and uh, buy no frills bread. It just said bread on that. Remember when you used to be able to go to the store and buy just bread? <laughs> I'd buy bread, and I'd buy, you know, the white and black label, bologna, and that would last for two or three days under the bush. And I thought I was doing pretty good, you know? That was an uptick from New Jersey. But when things would get so bad, and I white knuckled for a period of time, and then, and then I just couldn't do it anymore. Because I'm living without a solution, right? My solution is booze, and anything like booze, okay? That's the only thing in my life that's a light that turns off the pain and suffering that I think is going on inside of me, right? I come out of the house, to the left is the light of booze, and I don't know that over here on the right is a spiritual awakening in the steps and the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't know, right? I get to the point where I can no longer live with alcohol or live without. And I had spent about a year and a half staying as drunk as I possibly could. I was a full-time criminal, so I didn't have to show up for work. And no health care, trust me. And... All I had to do was kind of hold it together for other full-time criminals who looked as bad as I did. And that I couldn't even really kind of do at the end either. And uh, I felt horrible. And I just wanted, I just knew that something had to change. And I made a decision that I would, this time, that I would stop for good. This time was going to be different. This time I was not going to consume any, you know, anything and I was going to get my act together. And somehow I was going to pull my life out of the gutter that I was in. Uh, so I white-knuckled. The first day I could not eat, I could not sleep, I could do nothing. Second day I could do nothing but eat and sleep. Third day I could do nothing but throw up. Fourth day I woke up and I thought to myself, I've got this thing licked. And two hours later I had a glass of white wine in my hand. And I don't drink white wine. I don't drink white wine. And I just got a new... I'm not going to make it. I'm a defective unit. My entire life is void of anything. And I used to see those people, you know, all those healthy-looking people outside. I, you know, I'd be coming home from the bar at 6 in the morning, and uh, they'd be out jogging. <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> if there's not a cop behind me, I'm not running. <laughs> and not at 6 in the morning. <laughs> The fourth day I wake up, I got a glass of white wine in my hand. It's 10 o'clock in the morning, and I am hopeless. All right? I am hopeless. I do not believe the future will be any better. I am lacking hope. I know that I am a defective unit and that my life is over. And I decided there's only one feasible solution, and that's suicide. So I gather a friend of mine up later that afternoon. I said, we're going to go over to New York and get some pills. Because I figured the one thing I knew how to do was consume things. So I get him in the car, and we get over to 23rd Street, and I give him a couple hundred bucks and say, go get me some whatever. And he gets me some of whatever. I said, well, you know what? This isn't going to be enough. Go get me some more of whatever. So I give him a couple hundred dollars more, and he goes out, and I eat the whole bag. And he comes back, and I, and I say, here's a couple hundred dollars more. Go out and get some more whatever. He goes, where's the first bag? I said, I put it away for safekeeping. <laughs> and I, then I ate the second bag of stuff. And I don't remember anything after that. Oddly enough. I do remember that gravity took hold in a way I'd never experienced before. Um, And 
I do remember being dragged up the driveway of a, a local hospital. I somehow had made it back to Jersey. And it was very late at night because I remember it was very dark and it was very quiet. And I was being dragged up this driveway into the, into the emergency room of the hospital. And I was put on a gurney and put in a room. And I, I think my stomach was pumped. And uh, I, I, I woke up, right? And I was pissed because I'm not dead. And I had set out that night, that afternoon, to accomplish one thing and one thing only. And I thought, Jesus, what am I going to do now? But I looked around the emergency room, and I'm going through the drawers, and there's nothing that I'm going to use. I'm looking for more pills, by the way. There's nothing that's going to work. I'm not a fan of any sharp objects. I don't like pain. So I found this big bottle of Betadine solution. You know, the stuff they rub on you and then turns yellow and brown on your skin. And I started drinking that. And that doesn't kill you. <laughs> and it doesn't taste good. And it looks stupid running down your face onto your shirt. <laughs> so I thought I got to come up with a better plan than this. This isn't working. So I thought, I'm going to nonchalantly walk out of this hospital. <laughs> So I burst through the doors of the little room where I had left me on a gurney by myself into the bright white hallway and looked to my left and there's the big glass doors to freedom. All I gotta do is get through those doors and I'm home free. One small problem is the nurse station is there and there's a police officer standing there chatting with the nurses. So I said, this is not gonna work. He's gonna stop me. So I'm gonna have to come up with another plan. I'm thinking on my feet here, folks. You know, give me some credit. So I make a... I make a beeline for the crash cart that's next to the nurse's station, grab a bottle of rubbing alcohol, douse the police officer, and go for the matches in my pocket. Because I'm going to set him on fire. Because I figure if I create a diversion, I can make it out the doors. I think he was surprised, shocked, and then a little annoyed when I was going for the matches. And he put me down. And he put his knee on my neck, and he put the handcuffs on me, and screaming and whining, he put me back on that same gurney, uh, you know, and they put me in four-point restraints. And that was my chemical bottom. I laid there trying to chew through my wrist, because I had seen a movie where an animal chews through his paw to get out of a trap. It was 20 years later from the podium that I realized that if I had chewed through my wrist, I'd have no hand to undo the rest of the restraints. <laughs> and it came to me in the middle of telling this story that that was the fact. <laughs> so uh, I didn't have a lot of good plans that night. They wheeled me off to a psychiatric hospital due to my actions. And I'm really very fortunate to, be, to have been wheeled off to a psychiatric hospital. I was put on a locked ward to be evaluated because I was considered a danger to myself and to others. Alcohol took me to a place where I would do things. I have not, since I've gotten sober, tried to set fire to anybody. <laughs> Program of Alcoholics Anonymous works, you know? I have not, <laughs> not tried to chew any hands off either. You know, it's, alcohol took me to a place where I was completely and utterly devoid of any hope, right? I was at a point where I believed that there was no tomorrow, and that no tomorrow was a better was a better solution than than a tomorrow with me. I, for 30 days, they evaluated me on this um, psychiatric hospital, and the, the 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 answer came back that I wasn't insane; that I was a garden variety alcoholic. And I suffered from a spiritual malady, malady, a mental. Um, uh, obsession and, uh, and a physical craving, a phenom- an allergy, a phenomenon of craving. And they gave me two choices. I could go and be arrested outside the doors of the psychiatric hospital by the police officer who I tried to set fire to. Well, maybe not. I'm not sure. Or I could go to a locked uh, drug and alcohol ward. And I had to think about that. You know, is there a choice number three? Fortunately, um, you know, God works in mysterious ways, and I ended up on the locked drug and alcohol unit. And for two weeks, I didn't quite get it. You know, for two weeks, I, I, I wandered around there. I remember walking into the day room with my pants that no longer fit because I had started eating after a year and a half. And, uh, you know, my tube socks halfway off my feet and seeing the second step, you know. 
came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. And me thinking, I'm not insane. <laughs> I mean, I'm on a locked ward. <laughs> and I'm not willing to admit I'm insane. Fortunately for, fortunately for me, there was an alcoholic there who had about two years of sobriety. And he was one of those people. You ever see those people in alcohol silence? They're all bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, and they smile, and they look healthy, you know? And you just want to slap them when you got like a, when you got 11 days and, and you're feeling like the world's coming to an end. And how am I ever going to get through today, no less tomorrow, without booze? But this guy had that smile on his face. And I asked, you know, what, he, Kurt, he's still sober this day. We still see each other at the gym. I said, Kurt, you know, Tell me your story. I mean, I'm having no hope, right? I'm only in there to avoid prison. He tells me his story, and his story was, was a story that I could relate to. It was a story about bikers. It was a story about this. It was a story about that. And he told, and then he told me about a solution found in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. I was amazed because he had done the things that I had done, and he had acted the way I had acted, and he had been, you know, so a slave to this disease. You know, just absolutely, I cannot, I can tell you how many times I'd walk through the door and go, I'm not going to have a drink as I'm reaching for the bottle. I'm saying it out loud as my hand is moving, as if I'm controlled by somebody else. I'm going to go home at 11 o'clock. I drank with heavy drinkers. They'd go home at 11 o'clock, drunk, and get up for work the next day. I'd go to Staten Island. (laughs) <laughs> I didn't get the 11 o'clock thing. If you make it to 11, you can make it to 3. <laughs> he told me his story, and I finally got an idea that there was a solution. I went I, I, At the end of 110 days, coincidentally, completely in tandem with the fact that my insurance ran out, I was suddenly cured. And the rehab said... Uh, <laughs> time for you to go. Here's your $110,000 big book. Uh, Don't drink and go to meetings. I said, if I could not drink and go to meetings, I actually didn't say that, but I wanted to poke the doctor's eyes out when he did that to me. You know, it was 1985. You know, I turned 24 years old in rehab. And the best that they could give me was a big book of alcohol synonymous and tell me, don't drink and go to meetings. And that's, you know, there's Nothing wrong with that if the first thing I do is go to a meeting and find a sponsor and start to work the steps. But I'm looking for every out. You know, I'm looking for the, uh, the easy way still. Because I don't actually believe I can make it. I believe I'm so broken that nothing's going to fix me. Right? I get out and I'm willing to go to 90 meetings in 90 days. And I start going to meetings. And I make 90 meetings in 90 days. And when I got 90 days, I go out and shoot some heroin. You know, maybe at your home group you get a cake. I don't know. <laughs> but I was a good alcoholic because I came back and on the 91st day I raised my hand and I said, I'm David, I'm an alcoholic, and I got 91 days. I spent 17 years with that lie. 17 years. And if you have a lie like that, you can come and see me after the meeting. Because you know what? It was like acid on my sobriety. I'm not working a four-step. Searching in a fearless what? I don't think so. I didn't want to give up my time. 90 days. I didn't want to give up my time. I also didn't want to go to jail, and I figured if I said something, they might, you know, I was a lot of legal problems for a long time. Um, So I didn't talk about it. Having said that, I didn't do any step work. At five years, they asked me to, to qualify at my home group, and I did. And all I had was a drunk log. And even I was bored, you know? And I love listening to me talk. And, you know, at 10 years, I'm not making nearly the same amount of meetings. I was the guy who, if there was a roundup, a rodeo, a conference, a convention, or anything going on with 100 miles, I was talking you into going with me because I wanted to hang out with you guys. Because all you guys were happy joyous and free. And I wanted what you had as long as I didn't have to do the work. Ten years. I'm just not going to a lot of meetings anymore. You know, it's getting dull because I'm not doing the work. I'm not experiencing the nine step promises. My life has gone from being a high school dropout 
you know, literally hopeless to something more they could ever hoped. You know? I got my GED. I got into university. I've been going to class. I've been working. I've been getting a job. All these things, all the outside accoutrements to life were coming together. You know? I wasn't working the steps. Fifteen years. I'm as dry as a bone. I'm like, a, I'm like the foothills in, in Los Angeles. You know? I'm flammable. I'm not working the steps. I'm about to go combustible. 2002, a guy calls me up and says, you know, I have this business deal you can, you can do with this guy in Arizona. I said, I'm going. I had every intention of going to Arizona and getting drunk. I got on a plane, I went to Arizona, and I got drunk. I got drunk on white wine. I hate white wine. White wine does not solve my problems. I came home from that business meeting as demoralized as I had been in 17 years. Because I knew that I had nothing. And I'm not coming back to meetings. I'm not coming back to meetings to do the work I never did because I'm better than you people. And if you had asked me, I would have said, I've evolved out of Alcoholics Anonymous. I've evolved. Like one of those things coming out of the water. <laughs> Certain lack of spirituality in that comment, huh? So, two more years, and my wife has a suggestion. She goes, I want a divorce. <laughs> She was the most selfish, self-centered, self-serving, ungrateful person I've ever met. I said, what can I do? She goes, why don't you try AA again? So I'm back in these rooms on August 8th, 2004, 74 below in, in, in New York. And I raise my hand and I say, I've got one day back. And all of you people welcomed me as if I was a lost brother. Like I had never gone missing. Right? Then... 90 days passed, and I'm going to meetings every day, and I'm reading the big book. I'm doing searches on Google for four-step software. You know, I want to be a part of this. And the guy, and the guy who was sponsoring me was out in Chicago because he was my cousin. Um, and uh, Buddy is in his late 70s now. He still makes 10 meetings a week. He's 30-plus years sober. He's non-Spanish speaking. He started Spanish speaking meetings near his house and learned Spanish to do that. Guy's active. And I got him as a sponsor when I first came back because I, needed, I knew I needed to do the steps. What I knew was missing the first time was the steps and sponsorship. Right? I mean, I don't get a sponsor because I don't want to do the steps. So after 90 days, he says, you, know, you really need to get somebody local. And there's this kid who used to get up at the break at our, my old home group and say, you know, we have a temporary sponsorship program here. And he always had that stupid AA smile on his face. Hi, <laughs> I'm spiritual. <laughs> so I thought, you know, that puke is spiritual. I'm going to go ask him to be my sponsor. I'm going to wipe that smile off his face or get what he has. And uh, I asked him, and he started taking me through the steps. And, you know, one, two, and three is about me getting right with God. You know, I've got to admit that I'm an alcoholic. And then the big book references real alcoholic 14 times. You never hear anybody in a, pro, in a meeting go, hey, I'm Dave, I'm a real alcoholic. Almost never, right? But the book talks about it. And for me, a real alcoholic, what, what defines a real alcoholic for me? He said, when I drink, I cannot tell you with any certainty what's going to happen. And when I'm not drinking, I am ultimately going to drink again. I am powerless over um, alcohol. So when I consume alcohol, the wheels absolutely come off. I went to a party when I was 16 years old. I went to a party to go party with all my close friends. I woke up six hours later on the side of the road in Pennsylvania covered in somebody else's blood. That was not my plan that night. That is not the only time things like that happened. I'm unmanageable because to the best of my ability, I cannot stay away from a, a, a drink of alcohol. I had two hours on the fourth day away from alcohol, and I found myself drinking some, the only thing that was in the house. Problems over alcohol, and my life has become unmanageable. Not because I can't pay the bills, not because I can't keep a job. And I came back into the rooms of alcoholics, and I was as a dry, 
drunk, right? My life was unmanageable because I was the most unspiritual person in the world. I had drank 17 years later. Two and three about me getting right with God. You know, me accepting that, uh, you know, a power greater than myself is going to restore me to sanity. And I've got to surrender. Chuck Chamberlain talks about it, right? In a new pair of glasses, he talks about, you know, surrender is a continuous act. And I didn't get that when I first came back in. When I, what I got was you took these steps in the, in the order they were supposed to be taken, and you did these things like a task. Like, you know, if your wife leaves you a note, go clean the garage. You clean the garage. And then that's done. Make a decision to turn my will and my life under the care of God. I have to do that on a continuous basis. A guy like me wants to take that back. Four and five are about me. Six and seven are about God. And eight and nine are about you. I've got to find out what my insalable inventory is. Make, it, make a, a, a confession of that to my sponsor or to whoever, I, you know, whoever I, I, I'm, uh, I'm working with, you know, and to God. And then I'm going to go out and ask God to remove these uh, shortcomings, these defects. God, you know, Bill Wilson talks about it in the big book in a variety of different ways. You know, it's not just um, uh, character defects. It's shortcomings. It, he uses, he's a wordsmith. He uses a lot of words to describe these things. And I've got to take those actions. I've got to ask God to remove these shortcomings. Because I don't have the power to do that. My goal in life is to get a spiritual awakening. That's what the book promises me if I do the work. I'm going to get a spiritual awakening. My problem is not alcohol. My problem looks like alcohol because when I consume it, the wheels come off. Right? But the reality of the situation is, the first thing that happens to a guy like me, right, is I become spiritually unfit. And then I seek a solution outside of myself, which is alcohol, and I develop a mental obsession about that. And the last thing I do is drink. I've got to ask God to remove these shortcomings, because I can't do it. And I'll tell you something. I remember going through my, my sponsor, my first sponsor, right? We get to the sixth step. What can you possibly do work wise on the sixth step? We were entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. What can you possibly do? For me, that was like the middle of the steps. It's the coffee step. You take a break. This guy has me writing. What am I going to write on? He has me writing for six weeks. And you know what I figured out? I was catching up to him in the steps. That's what I figured. (laughs) That wasn't the truth, by the way. But that's what I'm thinking. But he, I guess maybe he had thought I might have a problem with humility. And uh, I've got to ask God because I can't do these things. And I remember walking down the streets having done six and seven on, in Manhattan on a beautiful day. And seeing beautiful women walking by and going in my head, please God take this from me, please God take this from me, please God take this from me. Because lust wasn't so easy to let go of. You know, i got a lot of character defects that aren't easy to let go of because I want to hold on to them, not because God's unwilling to get them. And i got to tell you something. When I did seven, it was the first time I really got two. Because i got to have a loving and caring God to hand this stuff off to. And if I don't, who's going to want to take this stuff? I've got to go out and make my amends. Right? Eight and nine are about you. And, uh, you know, the book is very clear. You know, I'm not supposed to make a living amends. I'm not supposed to make direct amends wherever possible, right? Um, and I had to do that. And there were people that, you know, I had this long period between the time that I got, I came off my chemical bottom to the time that I got truly got sober, right? So I had two sets of amends. I had amends, some of which could not be made because people had died in the interim. 60% of the people that I, I hung out with are dead when I was a kid. I'm 48 years old. 60% of the people that I hung out with on my street, the guys, my list of guys who I hung out with are dead. Um, there are guys I can't make amends to. Uh, parents of, of guys that I need to make amends to were dead. You know, um, I had to go out and make amends to 
those who I could, and I had to go out and make amends to the people that had occurred between the time that I hit my chemical bottom to the time I came back into the room. So that was a different set of amends. A lot of those were business amends. You know, I didn't steal from my partners, but I treated them poorly. You know, I was self-centered, self-serving. I did not have a spiritual awakening. I was all about me. One of the first amends I went to make was with my mother. Now, I had made amends to my mom before, but this time I actually meant it. You know, and I showed up with her. Now, i got to tell you something. Before making this amends, um, I complain. Why doesn't she come by the house more often? She has three lovely grandchildren. She lives nine miles from me. And I would complain that she wouldn't come over on the weekends. Now I sit down with her and I do my amends with her. And we're both sitting there crying. And this is during the week. The next Saturday morning I woke up and the first thing that came to my mind was, why don't I take the kids to Grammy's house? And if you had told me that simply making an amends would free me from the, from the bond itself with my mother, somebody who I had a close relationship with, I would never have gotten that. You know, I would never have realized that all of a sudden I'd want to do for others to the exclusion of myself. You know, one of the ways to describe a, a, you know, the beginnings of a spiritual awakening for myself is when I started to put my wants aside for other people's needs. Now, by the way, not all my, my men's went that well. I had some business partners who did not want to talk to me. Um, but, you know, I was willing to make the amends, and I've been willing to make the amends to anybody. Uh, I've reached out and gone and met with people who do not want to talk to me, and I can't change that. But I'm available to them anytime they want, anytime that they, they make the, 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 uh, the change. And they know that because I've told them that more than once. So 10 is 4 through 9, right? Now, I don't know about you, but I can't wait to the nighttime to make, I know, I know guys who like make, have these 10 step lifts, who make these complicated 10 step lists at the end of the day. They sit down, maybe they meditate a little bit, they make a 10 step list. I'm not like that. I tried that. My first sponsor was like that. Go home and make a list. Let's go through that. I'd get home and I have like five people on my list. I'm like, oh crap, and now I can't sleep. I'm thinking about it. I'm running scenarios through my head. I'm having conversations with people who aren't there, don't exist. You know, I'm going to make these amends tomorrow. Well, what happened was, you know, I used to trade on the floor of the American Stock Exchange. So what would happen is I'd, I'd be down in this very competitive environment, and I would really rip your heart out just to make a nickel. You know, that was my nature. And I'd go down to the floor, and I'd be, you'd be standing there, and a trade would come in, and I'd be like, buy him! You, you, you did nothing! You know, and I'd take the whole thing for myself. And a couple hours later, I'd start to feel bad about myself. Oh, gee, here we go. This is old behavior. You really needed to be more, you know fair and equitable, and I had to go find these people, you know, and I usually do it after the bell, and I go find these people and say, listen, I'm really sorry, and I started, you know, in the middle of the day, and I, you, you'd get it in my face, I'd be like, no, and like, you know, as I became more spiritual, of course, the time between where I go, well, I'm sorry, you know, to the time where I go, listen, I was wrong. You know, start to narrow. And I started to find that the more and more that I, I wanted to practice these principles, and I, someone would come up in my face, and then I would be like, no! <laughs> ah, forget it. You know, but the harder thing would be, many times in, in, at home, I'd come home, and, I'd come home at night, and I'd just be tired and torn up, and work would be hard, and you don't understand, and, rah, 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 and I'd walk through the door, and my wife would turn to me, and she'd just want to tell me about her day. And in the old day, would be like, leave me alone. You know, and I'd stand there, and I'd just quietly shut my mouth, and I'd listen to my wife, and she'd tell me the stuff. And in my mind, I would start to write down the important things that I was going to say while she was talking, and the things I was going to interrupt her with and tell her. Right? I'd write them down on little mental cards and put them in a little mental box on my little mental shelf. <laughs> and an hour later, I'd, you know, I'd sit there nodding my head, yes, honey, you know, and an hour later, I'd take my mental box off my mental shelf, and I'd go through those cards, because if something there was important, I'd be remiss in not telling her, right? So I'd take the first card out of the box and be like, did you think of that yourself? Well, that's probably not a good thing to say to her. <laughs> Tear that up. Second card out of the box, just like your mother. <laughs> no, I probably shouldn't say that. Don't need that. 
Third card out of the box, when monkeys fly out of my ass. <laughs> no, that's not going to be spiritual. And the problem here is that I started to realize that the vast majority of my problems were solved when I did not open my mouth. That the problem wasn't you people. The problem was that I interjected my thoughts and my opinions while you're trying to lead your life. So the tenth step for me became an evolution. It became an opportunity for me to sit back and to review for myself that I needed to not speak all the time. That the things that I thought were so dramatically important were better left unsaid. And my life improved dramatically. I started to get the nine step promises after I came to realize that the problems around me were typically of my own production. And doesn't Bill talk about that on 63? Right? The 11th step. I kind of knew how to pray. Right? I kind of knew how to pray. Prayer for me was always fairly easy. Right? I had some simple prayers. You know, I really kind of never had a problem with God coming into the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I just figured I, w- I didn't count. You know? And I would... S- I would pray... But I wouldn't get the ease and comfort that I kind of expected from doing an act of 11 step, right? And oddly enough, my first sponsor stopped calling me back. I'm not sure why. But uh, I got a second sponsor. And the second sponsor I got was the most spiritual guy I'd ever met at the time. Um, He's this little, like, five foot four truck driver with 30 plus years of sobriety. And he always had. He's really just, you know, he always condensed it down. To, like, you know, when Dr. Bob was dying and he spoke at the, in 1950 at the first AA International Convention and he said, when, when uh, reduced to the last, our, our, our fellowship was about love and service. You know, this real, just, you know, he's got that, yeah, that's what it is. I used to, you know, have this guy as a sponsor because he would reduce things for me into the simplest of terms, like I was a four-year-old, which I got. <laughs> so I called him up. I said, Kenny. I'm a little embarrassed because, you know, I've been sober, you know, two plus years and and I don't get the meditation part. He goes, Dave, do you pray? I said, yeah, Kenny, I pray. He goes, what do you pray? And I told him my prayer. He goes, that's great. Do you ever listen when you're done praying? Oh, I should sit there and I should quietly in, in, in contemplative meditation, listen for the answers to what's going on in my life. And I started to get a sense of well-being because the answers are known. For me, the answers are known. It's, It's the path that hurts others the least. It's the path where my wants are always secondary to somebody else's needs. The 12th step. You know, I... Was very active in my original home group, which is uh, 74 below on Trinity Place in Manhattan, and uh, I had a bunch of guys ask me to sponsor them uh, early on, and um, I would sponsor these guys, and inevitably they would fire me and go get other sponsors. Now I had always been the guy doing the I took over the temporary sponsorship role at my home group. I thought, geez, these guys are firing me all the time. This is getting annoying. You know, they're not even going out and drinking. I would have been happy if they went out and drank, you know, but no, they're firing me. <laughs> Bastards. And so I'm, I'm sitting on the toilet one day reading uh, the grapevine, and there's this little ad in the grapevine, right? And it says, guys, we need guys to write to guys in prison. And I'm like, that's the deal. They can't fire me. They can only not write back. <laughs> So I call up uh, the, you know, the home office, the uh, A&A home office, um, and I say, you know, I want to write to guys in prison. So they send me three names, and I write to these guys, and, and uh, one of them writes back to me uh, on a fairly consistent basis, and I go, I need three more guys, and they give me three more guys, and I write to those guys, and one of them writes back on a fairly consistent basis, you know, and uh, I'm talking to this one guy, all right? His name's Kevin. Kevin and I are hitting it off. And we're, and he goes, you know, I said, you know, Kevin, uh, he is, year and a half more than me, 
right? But I'm saying, Kevin, you know, if you haven't done the steps, you're going to need to do the steps. He goes, let's do them through the mail. I said, okay, I'll do them through the mail with you. I said, but when you get out, you'll get a sponsor and do them, through the, do them in person. He goes, no problem. So we're doing the steps through the mail, right? Now, when you're in prison, you can't do it on a, a searching and fearless moral inventory because you might do more time. You've got to change the phrase of what you're saying that you've done and, and, and talking about when you're writing to, to, to this guy. So we're writing back and forth, and all of a sudden, I stop getting letters from this guy. But I get a phone call. He goes, I just got out. Now, in case you're wondering, um, AA will hook you up with somebody in prison on the other coast of the country, just in case they get out and they're pissed at what you said. <laughs> so this guy gets out. This guy gets out, and he lives in Bakersfield. And they have him in a halfway house. He goes, Dave, I just got out. I'm like, wow, dude, you need to go get a sponsor. He goes, I'm not going to get a sponsor. I got you. I want you to be my sponsor. I said, Kevin, I can't sponsor you from, from New Jersey because you've already been doing it. I said, all right, well, what the hell? I'll try it. My, but I said, but I want you to know, my sponsor told me that I need to fire you and you're supposed to get another sponsor. He goes, I'm not doing that. All right. So now we're doing a real fourth step, a real fifth step, you know, and we're going over stuff for hours on the phone. And I'm working with this guy. And this guy's working with me, and my life is changing, and he's changing along, along the way. And we're connecting, you know, and all of a sudden, he's doing eight and nine. He's going out and making, he goes, I got a bill in the mail. You know, he owed a lot of money when he went to prison. He goes, I got a bill in the mail, what should I do? I said, well, I think you should pay it. <laughs> I said, throw caution to the wind, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> So he pays it. You know what they do? They send him a new bill for some other charges. I said, well, I guess something's going to go wrong. I said, contact them and find out what the total amount is for you to make this right. Because they were just keep sending him bills, right? They were a collection agency. He went and cleaned up his past far faster than he ever thought. Now, this guy is taking armfuls of big books and packs of cigarettes and going down to the Salvation Army every weekend in, in, in Bakersfield, California. And he's handing out the cigarettes and the big books to people. And he's doing big book studies with these guys. And these guys are getting out, and, and he's sponsoring them. And he goes, this is great, Dave. You've done such good for me. I'm like, I did nothing but sit on the toilet. You know? <laughs> what did I do? And he goes, this is a blast. I said, all right, well, so I'm come to Disneyland. I'm coming to Disneyland uh, in California. I said, uh, let's get together. So we get together, and we, and we speak at, at, in Bakersfield in front of 150 people, and we tell our story, and people are crying. And there was a little kid in the front thing, and I went, bam! And the kid jumped out of his seat, and the whole place was going crazy. And I don't get this. I don't get this under my own steam. Under my own steam, I'm in four-point restraints, trying to chew through my arm. I don't get this when my my best thinking comes into play. I get this because two alcoholics in June of 1935 shared with each other their story and began to realize that they could stay sober with the help of each other. I stood in Akron at the Cyberling Estate in the room where Dr. Bob and Bill first met after dinner. I get goosebumps just thinking about it. If you ever get a chance, Founders Day weekend, second weekend in, uh, uh, in June, thank you, second weekend in June every year, and it's a blast. It's a blast. <coughs> Kevin and I have become close friends. Kevin's been out to New Jersey. Kevin spoke at, at our home group. You know, Kevin carries the message. Kevin pulls up in front of a 7-Eleven a couple of weeks ago, uh, two months ago, and there was a guy panhandling for change at 7 in the morning, shaking, waiting to get some booze. Kevin goes in, buys him a can of beer, wraps his phone number around that beer, and hands it to the guy and says, Brother, I've been there. If you want to feel different, call, it, call me on my number, and I'll take you to a meeting. Two weeks later, that guy's in a halfway house. I didn't do that. Kevin didn't do that. The program of Alcoholics Anonymous in its unbridled form, 
the simple message that was carried to me by one alcoholic that I hope that I can sometimes carry to another alcoholic did that. For 5,000 years, people like you and I died from alcoholism. From the first time they crushed, crushed grapes. And now I get to lead a life beyond my wildest dreams. Right? Not this past weekend, but the weekend before, my daughter had a bat mitzvah. 13 year old daughter had a bat mitzvah. And um, I found out two days before that that she had a boyfriend. <laughs> yeah, he's going to be at the bat mitzvah too. I'm going to track him down. And I'm standing there at the bat mitzvah, and this little blonde haired kid runs up to me and hands me an envelope and goes, This is for Lucinda. And he runs away. And Lucinda's new boyfriend's name is Ryan. And I look down on the envelope and it says, to Lucinda from Ryan H. I thought, Ryan? Get over here! But I shouldn't have that. You know, I mean, not that I shouldn't have that, but a guy like me doesn't get that kind of end to his story. You know, a guy like me ends up with the choice of, you know, of jails, institutions, or death. You know, a guy like me, I drank at all costs. You know, and today I've been given a gift, and it's a simple gift. And my responsibility is to carry that gift unchanged without Dave's opinion attached to it to you guys. Thank you very much. There, there was a lot of good stuff starting on page A3 that I, I had every intention of covering today. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.